we are so pleased to have a an amazing group of uh, specialists or, or, or experts on the subject matter, and I'm proud to introduce them today. So, firstly, I want to introduce our moderator, Mr. Bill Amata. Bill Amata is Chairman and Chief Connectivity Officer of IW Group, a fully integrated marketing communications agency specializing in the multicultural markets. For more than three decades, Bill and his team have served some of the top global firms and governmental agencies, including the CDC, Gilead, Lexus, McDonald's, Nielsen, Netflix, Northwestern Mutual, Walmart, Walt, Walt Disney, Warner Brothers, Wells Fargo, and many others. Bill's areas of expertise includes marketing, public relations, advertising, transcultural communications, and crisis management. Bill is a co-founding member of several national and regional organizations, including the APIA Scholars, formerly Asian and Pacific Islander American Scholarship Fund, Asian Pacific Islander American Chamber of Commerce and Entrepreneurship, also called National ACE, and ACE Next Gen, and the National Millennial and Gen Z Community, an organization that promotes civil discourse and civil engagement. Bill also serves on the boards of the Advertising Educational Foundation Center for Asian American Media, Coalition for Asian Pacifics, Pacifics and Entertainment, and LaGrant Foundation, National ACE and PBS Foundation. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. And of course, one of uh, now I'm going to introduce our panelists. Telly Wong is a, C a senior VP and chief content officer for IW Group. Telly creates experiential next-gen marketing campaigns for clients such as McDonald's, Warner Brothers, HBO, and Brown Foreman. With an emphasis on cross-cultural and om omni-channel programs, his work has been recognized with honors by leading industry organizations, including PRSA, PR Daily, and PR News. Some of his notable projects include developing the Asian American strategy for crazy rich Asians. We all love crazy rich Asians. Creating McDonald's B-Boy Royale and producing Verizon's hashtag freestyle 50 challenge. In 2016, Telly was named PR News Awe Professional of the Year, a native New Yorker and graduate of NYU's Tisch School of Arts. His personal heroes include Christopher Hitchens, Charles Bronson, and Pinhead. Um, and not to mention uh, also the brainchild behind the hashtag uh, Wash the Hate Movement. So welcome, Telly. Now, uh, we also have Mr. Albert Shen, who's a huge advocate for the chamber here. So hats off to you, Albert. Thank you for joining us today. Albert is the executive leader in governmental affairs, DNI business development, telecom, smart cities, and mobility innovation in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Currently, he is the Texas and South Central Regional Manager of Business Development for Verizon Smart Communities, as, as well as the National Lead for Smart Airports. His role is to develop strategic relationships and partnerships with federal, state, and local government officials to build smart, city, smart community solutions. Previously, he served in the Obama administration as the National Deputy Director at the U.S. Department of Commerce, Minority Business Development Agency, which is MD, MBDA, in Washington, D.C. In that role, it was his job to architect new, and new innovative domestic and international economic development programs and new social program strategies to grow small and minority-owned businesses so that all communities can prosper in America. He has served on numerous politically appointed boards of directors at the state and local level, including various leadership board positions on nationally recognized nonprofit organizations. He has extensive experience with board governance and practiced the importance of strategic policy and oversight of large institutions that require transformative business oriented decisions. Welcome, Albert. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Karen Locke, and I have to give you a, a props for, for coming on this panel. Karen was one of our uh, past, uh, women of the year for our, our Women's Business Conference, so welcome. So Karen joins us as the Regional Vice President and Associate General Counsel of TIAA. TIAA is a Fortune 100 financial services organization that is leading provider of financial services in the academic, research, medical, cultural, and governmental fields. 
In her role at TIAA, Karen is the primary interface for the company and its subsidiaries on all legislative, executive, regulatory, and administrative matters for the South, Mid Southwest, I'm sorry, South and Midwest regions. Her expertise includes policy development, regulatory negotiation, lobbying, coalition building, and industry relations. At the company, Karen is active in gender and racial diversity in initiatives. She was the former corporate co-chair of Women's Employee Resource Group, Denver Chapter, and is currently a member of Denver Leadership Council and Dallas Leadership Council. Now, Karen is the immediate past board chair and member of the executive committee of the Texas Women's Foundation. She serves on the executive board of Texas State Bar College. In addition, Karen is a board member of the Dallas Assembly and a Leadership Dallas alumnus. So in 2015, Karen co-founded the Orchid Giving Circle, which provides communities, uh, community grants to support social change and services to the North Texas Asian community. Karen's community involvement and expertise in racial and gender equity issues led her to, recent, to her recent advisory board appointment to Canaries Incorporated, a technology company that aims to foster collaboration between employers and employees on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Welcome, Karen, and thank you for joining us. On that note, we're going to go dive right into uh, the meat of our, our event today. And I want to go ahead and send it to Telly to um, open with his, uh, his the introduction for this webinar. Telly, please go take it away. Yeah, I, yeah. thank you, Susan. I just wanted to quickly walk through uh, what the Wash the Hate campaign is, how it got started, and uh, I'll just provide a little bit of background uh, that I think is relevant to what's happening right now in the country. Uh, so if, if that deck uh, could be pulled up. So I'll get right into it. Um, Wash the Hate campaign was an organic grassroots campaign that our agency at IW Group put together. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, Susan already went into depth about the agency, so we can just move uh, move ahead. Uh, so yes, this was a, we at our at IW Group, we saw the, the rise in hate incidents and assaults that were taking place across the country. And uh, myself being in New York, uh, we were finding that some of these were happening multiple times a day uh, from starting, you know, end of February, beginning of March. And we felt that as an Asian American focused agency, we really had a responsibility to react and do something about it. Uh, especially as the assaults and incidents were escalating um, to much more violent uh, occurrences. And next slide. So how we decided to respond uh, was we really wanted to begin by raising awareness about COVID related discrimination uh, against the Asian American community. And we recognize that not everyone is going to be especially these days, looking at the news or thinking about xenophobia or discrimination or racism as part of their daily life. Uh, so how do we get our message out there to people that are not necessarily looking for it? So we thought as a marketing agency, we could tap into our resources, our relationships um, and our teams in order to put something together. Uh, so we do a lot of work in the entertainment space. Uh, so we had a great stable of celebrities, influencers, and leaders that we could uh, talk to and partner with. And we really wanted to make sure that this campaign had legs on social media. And obviously we were up against some unique challenges uh, because of the timing. Uh, we were discussing this in early March and things were changing daily in terms of what was possible, what we could do uh, with the quarantine, with the lockdown, and just uh, realistically what we, how we can get something approved, funded, and out into the market and really within the course of one or two weeks. So we just decided, you know what, instead of waiting for someone to give us some funding or a client to buy in, let's do it ourselves. And that's how our campaign uh, came about, uh, hashtag watch the hate. And we launched this campaign on March 18th, which was the day uh, after uh, President Trump's controversial press conference where he doubled down on his uh, use of the term Chinese virus to describe uh, the pandemic. And we launched this campaign with a video, uh, he a hero video, as well as content. I'm gonna quickly 
share this video with you and uh, you'll take a look at sort of the context and how we positioned our message. COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. This is likely just the tip of the iceberg. I'm going to use the National Guard. How we can protect ourselves. So everyone on the subway today thought I had coronavirus because I'm Asian and because of how my face looks right now. Asian American minding his own business as a total stranger berates him. Messed up doesn't even begin to describe what Anna Shandy saw as Korean student was cold cocked on her right jaw. And now when people like me are getting racially assaulted because of the coronavirus, I will talk about that. We also um, had content that we asked all of our partners to produce. So what the prompt was, is that how to participate in this campaign was to film uh, a short video of yourselves washing your hands uh, for at least 20 seconds in accordance with CDC regulations and recommendations. And while you're doing that, share a story about how the pandemic has affected your life and share those stories on your social media platforms. So those were the prompts. And that was the content that we were sourcing from the public, beginning with our partners. And on the next slide, you just see a couple of videos um, and a couple of individuals who were part of the launch. So uh, really high profile Asian Americans from the arts, fashion, uh, digital influencers, small business owners. And we also launched with the support of um, two dozen community-based organizations. Okay, and the next slide, uh, here's just some sample content, which I won't play, but uh, we can share links to. And these are some of these videos uh, received some great traction. And as a result, we started getting the word out there into the local media, the national media, and also social media. And the great thing about the campaign, we were inviting everyone to participate. So on the previous slide, you'll see some of the people outside of our community, outside the Asian American community, really taking our message to heart and posting their own videos and, and sharing in this message of unity. Next slide. And what else we did with our platforms is we, we opened it up to victims of hate incidents and we allowed them to contact us, share their experiences, and we would anon anonymously post those experiences on our social platforms uh, to give them a voice. And I think what's most exciting and probably the most relevant uh, to what's happening right now is the allyship that we saw beyond the Asian American community. And here are just a couple of uh, small examples of that. So uh, Walmart got on board with our campaign very early on. And what you see here on your left is the uh, senior vice president of diversity and inclusion of Walmart uh, making his own watch to hate video and standing in solidarity with the community. And we also saw that effect happen with uh, various uh, organizations and uh, educational institutions. And then most recently, and we'll, sh we'll circulate this link, uh, we also launched a public service announcement that, that we um, have been distributing to TV stations across the country to really raise awareness about um, related discrimination. Imagine a stranger spitting in your face getting assaulted for wearing a face mask, or getting punched in the face for not wearing one, seeing your children attacked with a knife, and blamed for a virus that has killed hundreds of thousands of people. Since the outbreak of COVID-19 in the United States, hate incidents against Asian Americans have been on the rise. In these unprecedented times, our country needs unity, not division. Let's come together and watch the hate. Currently, what we're doing with our platform that we've built on the next slide is in light of everything that's going on, uh, we've paused our campaign and we have really uh, been donating the, um, our, our platforms to really uh, amplifying awareness and standing in solidarity with um, Black Lives Matter and the protests that are happening throughout the country. I just want to say uh, thank you uh, to Telly for uh, doing that presentation. And I want to welcome everyone again to our webcast uh, for the Asian Chamber of Texas. And we especially want to say thank you to Susan, Divya, 
Shago and Neha for uh, pulling uh, all of us together and for all of the panelists uh, to do this during this really difficult time. Uh, but one thing that we wanted to start off by saying is that our hearts and our sympathy go out to George Floyd and his family and his friends. Uh, we know that uh, they have a strong connection to the state of Texas, uh, and uh, we think we would be uh, remiss if we did not acknowledge uh, the pain that we all feel as Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders uh, for the tragic death of George, My uh, George uh, Floyd and so many other African Americans based on social injustice, uh, institutional racism, classism. And so uh, we as chambers uh, all around the country and the chambers in Texas, uh, I think uh, this is something that we're gonna have to face head on. So we wanted to acknowledge that right away. Uh, let everyone know that uh, we are aligned with our uh, friends and colleagues in the African-American community and all communities that have been impacted by social injustice. Uh, but we're here to talk about xenophobia. Uh, and in Telly's presentation, um, he talked a little bit about um, the rise in anti-Asian and Pacific Islander acts of hatred, bigotry, and xenophobia. And just in four short weeks in April, between March and April, over 1,700 people all around the country, including Texas, filed reports of acts of hatred, violence, bigotry, vandalism, uh, people making statements uh, either overtly or covertly um, to uh, people in our community. And so one of the first things I wanna ask the panel, and I wanna start off with Albert, since Albert has a direct connection uh, working in government, how important is it for people, is it for people in Texas, especially uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders to report acts of violence, hatred and bigotry uh, in this state? Albert, do you wanna start? Yeah, no, thank you, Bill. And thank you, Susan, ACT for having us here. It's great to be here in Dallas, Texas, where it is definitely getting hotter and hotter by the day. But Bill, no, thank you for that question. It is one of the most critical pieces in terms of helping solve a lot of the institutional barriers when it comes to racism in this country. Having served in the Obama administration, uh, data was a critical focal point for us and for the congressional members too, because whatever happens at any type of level that people experience with any type of hate, uh, even if it's as minor as the verbal assaults, uh, obviously the physical assault, that you do report that to your local police department and you do report that to the local FBI department because, because that data does get translated up to the top policymakers, both uh, on the executive side and the legislative, both in state and federal level. And because that translate to more policy that can help our communities directly, not just Asian American, but any community. And that policy then translates to funding how that then where does money need to be allocated to various cities and communities so that law enforcement and other programs both at the national advocacy level nonprofit get allocation funding to build new systems to be able to fight that because you can't solve the problem without that data so again thank you bill for that 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 is just as critical and just really quick is to plug in for the u.s census it's critical that this community everyone fills out their census it is made like electronically now that, that also helps out the Asian American community, even when it comes to these type of hate crimes, to know where Asian Americans are and how to best allocate resources and also help determine our representation in the future. And, and we clearly know that we have to have data, Albert. And I know, uh, Telly, you're also pushing uh, for people to report any acts of, uh, of hate and bigotry and xenophobia. Uh, and one thing that you're doing, and, and Albert, uh, I think you're doing as well, is that you don't have to say your name uh, you don't have to provide that information, uh, but you could do this anonymously, but we still need that information. So Telly, um, you're you're providing a voice for people uh, through the Watch the Hate campaign and there are a number of other campaigns. Uh, how, is it, how important is it for people to report, even if they're fearful of reporting? Yeah, I think uh, to echo what Albert said, that reporting is critical because we need that data and we need to address the problem. And uh, we can't do that if we just ignore it and, and you know, shove it under a rug. Uh, so that's something that's been very important to us is to, to not only raise awareness about it, but really direct people to resources. And that's what we do on our website at watchthehate.com. So um, 
reporting. If you were a victim of an incident or a hate crime, please report it and please share it and let people know that this is happening because it's very easy, I think, historically as, as a community, we've just been very quiet when um, dealing with similar situations. And then it just gets, people assume there's not, not a problem. And I think fortunately, the bright side of things is that the community has been very vocal on this issue and has really raised uh, the awareness of this issue at a national level. Yeah, and uh, there, there, there's a number of campaigns. So um, Telly and the team from IW Group uh, join others, uh, including uh, Hate is a Virus and uh, uh, Racism is a Virus and a few others. And so there's tremendous awareness all across the country because not only have people like Walmart and NBC and ABC and Fox News covered stories about uh, the rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, uh, there's greater awareness all around the country that uh, we need to put a stop to this. Uh, but now that we have this uh, hate is uh, a virus and wash the hate and all these campaigns that have generated awareness, what do we need to do next? And I wanted to throw that question to Karen. Um, what do we need to do next now that people are aware uh, and, and uh, more sensitized to these uh, acts of hatred and xenophobia? Thank you so much for the Asian Chamber of Texas and then obviously ser serving uh, on this panel of everyone. I, um, I think that I break that responsibility down on an individual level, a corporate level, as well as a community wide level. On an individual level, I think we need to bear responsibility to get out there, not just to vote, participate in the census, but to really be upstanders when you see acts of racism or even just simple acts of microaggression. So not overt, not anything that is sim you know, using a derogatory word, but just kind of those subtle digs at an individual. So that's a personal responsibility. On a corporate wide, if you're in a corporation, I think what you need to do is participate in BRGs or ERGs or if you're on an executive level, become a sponsor. It is part of our responsibility to do that. Then on a community level, I think Albert and Telly have given great examples of how we are able to participate. But I do believe that engagement now more than ever is important. And self-reflection. Um, had a very interesting conversation with one of my Black sisters who have known forever we are in the philanthropic world and do things in the community. And she challenged some of my personal beliefs on what I need to do by not doing anything and not standing up and not speaking. You are complicit in part of the problem. So get out there, get outside of your comfort zone and engage. Well, Karen, this is a really interesting topic that you kind of bring up. And it's one of the questions that uh, I would like uh, the panelists to think about. Um, bullying is up in all the different schools, and we're seeing all over Texas, including Dallas, Fort Worth, Allen, Arlington, Frisco, Plano, we're seeing a rise in bullying in high schools, in junior high schools, in elementary schools, uh, but we're also seeing things happening in restaurants, in bus stops, uh, people making comments uh, that are racist or xenophobic, and some of the people that have been bullied and some of the people that are in these restaurants and some of these people that are standing at a bus stop say that uh, they're being berated by all sorts of people but there's bystanders bystanders everywhere around so one example was a person walked into a chinese owned restaurant and said i'm not going to shop at your restaurant anymore because you need to go back to china uh, and there were a number of customers that were in that restaurant and said absolutely nothing. Uh, and afterwards, uh, as soon as that person walked out of the, um, the restaurant, the next customer came up and said, I want to place my order. Uh, and that person that was uh, the restaurant owner was visibly shaken and upset. Uh, and the same thing happens day out and day in at high schools and, and colleges, people bullying people and making comments and people all around saying absolutely nothing. Do bystanders have a responsibility to say something and do something and intervene? Absolutely, let me jump in here. Um, part of what we need to do as a community is to educate and building allies. I believe Telly mentioned having allyship when doing the wash to hate 
it's important for others to recognize that I am somebody's sister, I am somebody's mother, we that I I am I'm, I'm a child of somebody. So in order to do that, we have to share the experiences, personal experiences, like me telling on social media that I did not want my mother, who is maybe 4'11 on her tippy toes, not even five, that I told her she shouldn't go to the Asian, um, she shouldn't go to the grocery stores at the very beginning, except if you're going to go go to the ones in the Asian market, because I was genuinely concerned for her safety. When I share that to my husband, who is Caucasian, he was surprised, he was shocked, he didn't think it would happen in our own community, but it would, and I was genuinely concerned about that. And to this day, she still only shops at the Asian market until things calm down. And, and, and it's really important what you said, uh, Karen, about allies and Telly, you talked about it as well. Um, and I have to say, you know, when, when the Wash Day campaign came out, a few of the African-Americans uh, and Latinx folks uh, called me and pulled me aside privately and said, I absolutely support what you're doing to raise awareness about xenophobia against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. But guess what? Uh, we're dying in COVID-19. 60% um, of the cases in neighboring Louisiana, uh, the people that are passing away are African Americans and then the Latin communities and some of the Pacific Islander communities that are on the front lines in these warehouses that are working on meat plants uh, to make sure that people have food on their table are also coming down with a virus. And so um, how is how important it, is it for us to gain those allies, but also to be allies uh, for the African-American community, Latin uh, community, et cetera? Telly or Albert? Yeah, yeah I'll start. Um, I think allyship is has been really critical for our campaign for Watch the Hate um, because I think oftentimes uh, in the Asian American community, we often talk to each other and our messages really don't get beyond, you know, dinner conversations or, or conversations within the context of an Asian American conference. And we really need to bring our, our issues and our concerns to a larger platform. And the only way that's going to happen and the only way we're going to create some change if we develop allyship beyond our communities. And we saw fantastic allyship happening on a grassroots level, at a corporate level, with uh, Wash the Hate. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why we've decided uh, to really uh, stand with uh, Black Lives Matter with the, with the protests and, and the situation, because we really want to return uh, the goodwill and support that we've received from the other communities. I think that's great. And, and Karen yeah. and Albert, I know you both have, have kids. Um, there is a question in the uh, chat box that says, you know, how do we have this conversation with kids uh, so that um, they don't feel insecure, they don't feel fear uh, when they leave their homes? No, I think, uh, you know, that's a, that's a great point. Children sometimes are at the front line on absorbing a lot of the hate because, as we know, teenagers and kids can be very ruthless in terms of uh, uh, social interaction. Uh, and I think we know, you know, even from the government data that right now, by the year 2044, the United States is going to be a majority minority country and many states are already that way. So the importance of both the allies and our youth uh, becoming so more multicultural with many, so many diverse backgrounds. The Asian Americans have many different ethnicities amongst it, the Latino communities just as equally as complex and then also the african-american community so those three predominant communities uh, are such an integral part of the u.s economic fabric that when this pandemic hit it so disproportionately affected our communities at such much deeper economic level both on economics but also from an education perspective and even the tribal nations too we're just seeing so many more deaths uh, occurring and the lack of resources in the tribal nations too in this country. So I think for children, they have to understand that you know the country is becoming more diverse. We have to teach them to embrace that diversity. It's an asset for everybody, uh, but it's also, I think as Karen mentioned earlier, getting involved. And I think getting our children involved in understanding what is our political and governmental system that to remind us as adults that we have to take the time to vote. Uh, regardless how that method of voting is, that it's a critical part of 
you know, being in this country in terms of doing our duty to vote, uh, but also educating our kids on, again, the complexity uh, and the necessity of civic and community engagement. So it is a challenging conversation because so many uh, competing interests right now that children that we all are uber parents, you know, for our kids, driving them to one activity to another right now. Uh, but during this pandemic, obviously, we're not doing that as frequently. So this is an opportune time for us to have those deep conversations with our children and so, so, to get them so to understand. Albert and Karen Bill, can tell. Yeah, go ahead, Karen, please. So I think when you're talking about children, what we like to do as parents are always to create this protection, right? It's our job to protect our children. But in a situation like what we're going through, I think if we simply ignore it, just ignore as if it didn't happen, no matter the age. And that's actually something we should think about is how old the children are and how much detail you go into. But simply ignoring the problem is not addressing the underlying issue. We really need our children and our next generation to take up the torch where it is and keep carrying the baton forward. So I think it's critically important for us to talk to the children and resist resist the urge to just throw you know a blanket around and cocoon and protect them because the harsh reality is out there and i'd rather my children hear about the hatred and the brutality and be able to really educate them rather than having them see it on social media with no explanation or context yeah we, we've had some conversations on another panel that i was on that said that um, asian americans and pacific islanders have these kind of cultural barriers uh, and that parents and grandparents occasionally will say, you know what, just keep your head down. Uh, if something happens to you, just ignore it. Don't pick a fight. Uh, but we're also hearing from another side of the community that uh, we need to be advocates for ourselves. Now, if somebody's being bullied or, uh, you know, one of the Indian restaurants down the street or a business uh, perfumery, um, you know, was, uh, you know, um, harassed in LA, how might they become advocates for themselves? Um, any thoughts on that? Because uh, we're, we're saying people need to stand up, people need to address bullying and address hatred, but how might they be better advocates for themselves if they're faced with discrimination or bullying or xenophobia? Yeah, I, I, yeah obviously, uh, you know, those type of interventions are, you know, difficult decisions. Sometimes you're in a situation where, you know, whether it's your own safety, you could, you're not sure what's going to happen if you're going to intervene or advocate for somebody but there definitely are organizate national organizations out there uh, that have local presences that serve asian american communities and they have many different resources that are there to benefit our community you know even like the asian american justice center in washington dc where you know they have a legal defense fund uh, so there's many different types of organizations that are looking out for us. So I think the critical thing is that you, when things happen, you're not alone. And I think as we embrace ourselves as a community that, you know, you feel uh, hesitant or, you know, to advocate for yourself, don't feel like you're alone. There are groups out there, there are people out there that they can reach out to any one of us or look online. Uh, there is a very, I think, organized network of national groups to make you feel like you're not alone so you don't feel vulnerable when you are going to confront something like that. Yeah, and there's probably a number of um, organizations in Texas, but maybe that's something we could provide Susan uh, after this is over, a list of places where people can get help. Uh, we've also seen quite a bit of uh, incidents of people really having trouble dealing with this. And so mental health is uh, an issue that we need to tackle as a, as a community. So there are mental health organizations that are there to help as well. Uh, but I also see another question that says, how do we talk to our parents? Now, if you're a younger person, uh, how do you talk to your parents and, and the people that are your caregivers about how to create these allies uh, with not only the Black community, but the Latinx community? Uh, and, and I have to say, uh, when I go to a lot of events, I was in Texas, you know, maybe a few months ago, and I was sitting on a panel with African Americans and Latinx folks, and the entire conversation, the African American and the Latinx folks kept saying, black, brown, black, brown, black, brown. And I kept raising my hand saying, well, what about Asian Americans? I'm on this panel too. And one of them finally said, um, you're not one of us. Um, you guys are part of the privileged class. Uh, you guys are part of the 1%. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, that really struck me as a really important reason for us to create these allyships with uh, other communities of color, particularly the Black, Latinx, and Native American communities. So how do we talk, how do they talk to their parents about building these allies uh, yeah. in these communities? I'd like to start. So uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, a uh, fairly mixed area. Um, and it, it was an interesting experience. It was kind of growing up with all these different people around me and really not thinking twice about it and thinking that's the norm. <laughs> and then you kind of like go to college and, and things change. But I think, um, and that's a question that's been asked a lot about how do we talk to our parents? Uh, how do we talk to the older generation but that might have a completely different experience with uh, when it comes to interacting with different communities? And I think it shouldn't be a one-way conversation. I think, I think children should understand why their parents might feel a certain way. Uh, we live in the era of uh, my truths and we should really understand where the other person is coming from uh, so that we can really develop a, a purposeful dialogue. And on the other side of things, I've been on numerous panels this past, uh, these past several weeks when it comes to discussing and, and the question of allyship has been brought up. And one of the huge barriers seems to be this notion, this, this, um, this pretense that uh, we're all too different from one another. The, the groups are too different, Asians are one way, African-Americans are another. And we never seem to focus on commonalities that we have the historic commonalities. I mean, you look at the uh, Asian American activism uh, that sprung up in the in the 70s that was very heavily influenced by the civil rights movement and, and African American leaders. And I think sometimes we forget a lot of that stuff. You know, you look at sort of what, you know, martial arts cinema in the 70s and, and young African American kids in inner cities gravitating towards that because of the message. Um, and I, I think that those 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 similarities and those commonalities just get to, uh, seem to be lost uh, when we're discussing race these days and we're only focused on what makes us different and i think we just need to um, have a little bit of a deeper conversation and remember what came before us and look at history to really guide us into this current situation i love that telly but it's really interesting is that uh, there's a question about uh, uh, asian pacific islander consciousness uh, younger people allegedly may not have that feeling of uh, a pan-Asian consciousness uh, because a lot of the Gen Z folks and millennials say, you know, we live in a diverse world, we accept diversity, uh, we live it. Um, is there a pan-Asian consciousness that exists in our community? And how might that play um, in a world where, where there is xenophobia rising against uh, our community? By the way, none of these questions were uh, sent to any of the panelists, so they're probably going to have to think about some of these That's questions. Obvious. They're really complex. <laughs> yeah. I, work with, I work with a lot of younger people, with, uh, you know, with what I, with the type of work that I do, and work with a lot of Gen Zers and deal with uh, millennials and everything. So I think there is a consciousness, uh, whether or not I can define it, I, I'm not sure if I'm the most apt to, but certainly there is an identity amongst uh, younger Asian Americans that did not quite exist uh, when I was, you know, in high school, other than just that uh, we're all, we all look the same. But now that I think there's more of a collective consciousness about, okay, if you're Asian American, you have these things in common, or you listen to this type of music, or you're into these sort of things. Um, so there's, there's more of that happening. And I think the, that's, you know, on one hand, that's pride, pride. On the other hand, that just sort of creates walls around the community. And, and make it difficult for, for dialogue to happen. So I, I certainly think there is an identity depending on who you ask. I think broadly speaking, yes, but we also cannot limit ourselves to just that one identity, especially in the world that we live in. Well, I wanna, I wanna advocate for Karen and myself as we are the Generation <laughs> X. We are never talked about. Oh, yeah, well, nobody wants to talk about <laughs> no Generation X. About you guys are, yeah, nobody wants to talk about you guys. <laughs> it's always about the baby boomers, the millennials, or Gen Z. But I, I, right. I think just to, you know, tack on uh, Tilly real quick before Karen jumps in is, uh, yeah, the generational divide is clearly a, a huge talking point amongst both on the social issues and economic issues and and uh and, as far, and from a leadership perspective so it is a obviously a difficult conversation when older generations are very tied to their cultural identity and how they were raised and but that is part of but it's you know you know it's i know it's difficult it's never easy but sometimes it's just a matter of wearing them down 
uh, and then, but have that understanding of the continued conversation on, you know, what the generation uh, challenges and for Gen X like us, like you said, no one wants to talk about us. So what do we have to do to be visible in order to do that? Because we are actually the next generation leaders that are going to bridge the gap, you know, for the millennials, the Gen Zs, and the baby boomers. So use us as that resource to help type that, uh, to convey that language. So Karen, yeah, whatever else you had, jump right in. So I think that um, there is a geographical um, distance as well. So the East Coast and the West Coast certainly have a lot more sophistication and a lot more com uh, communication within the communities. Whereas if you live kind of in the South, when I grew up in Houston, Texas, the it's now getting to the point where there's a lot more communication between the different communities as well as inter-community. But we are getting there. And I think for a kind of a, a word of encouragement to the young folks that are on the on the phone today or on um, video today, my mother is in her 60s. I mean, my mother's in her 70s. She's 76. Don't tell her that I told you guys. The she actually have come a long way in understanding what the difference is and what the challenges are. And we just talk to each other. Um, I said to her just yesterday about some of the ingrained perception on why children um, want to go off to college instead of staying close by. And this is in context of one of my nieces. So it, it can be done. She got it and she got it. And I heard her repeat what I said to my uncle. And so it can be done. It's just a, you just have to be patient and resist the urge to just assume that they will never change their mind. Mm. I, I, I was talking about uh, the um, anti-Asian hate crimes, uh, the xenophobia that exists in our community with uh, a couple of the African-American leaders and Latinx leaders. And uh, one of the very prominent national leaders said to me, um, Bill, um, I just want to say one thing. Welcome to the club. This has been happening to us for four centuries. Um, we have been discriminated against, spit on, killed and murdered, people giving us mean looks wherever we walk down the street. Uh, and, and this is our reality every single day, every minute of our lives. Um, how will you help us so that we could help you. And, and uh, I thought that was a very important statement. So, but, but a lot of times we're in silos. And so how do we break out of these silos and, 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 and connect with African-American communities and Latinx communities and lower income white communities in a place like Texas, uh, where, there, where, where those communities all diverge in one place and people need to confront uh, diverse issues. How do we do that? How do we um, let the African American community, the lower, uh, the low income white communities, the Latinx communities know that we want to be part of the solution with them. So how do we break well, out? I think, silence? Bill, I think, yeah, for on that one, you know, for many of us that might be on this call there in the private sector, we work in corporations, you know, we had touched about ERGs, the importance of ERGs within each corporation, whether it's Asian American, Latinx, or African American. This is our opportunity to leverage those. ERGs up to senior leadership to push for, you know, the corporate responsibility side to make more investment in those communities. Like Verizon the other day announced from our CEO, Hans Vesper, a $10 million, uh, $10 million investment from the Verizon Foundation to eight of the top African-American organizations in the country. So, and many other corporations are starting to do that. So I think within us, that is probably one of the most effective ways with those of us in the corporate world to work with cross sector across the ERGs within the corporations. That, that's how we can help our brothers and sisters uh, address the racism that's in this country. And this is how corporate America can help with that in terms of those financial investments are very yeah. critical. And I think you're doing that. I think TIAA and, and Verizon and AT&T and State Farm and Toyota, you're already reaching across the ERGs and the BRGs are doing that. So, so I think uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, that entire region where you're at has a real opportunity to kind of change those conversations and engage uh, at a deeper level. So uh, I think you're in a really good position. Uh, so even if you're not on the East Coast or on the West Coast, uh, I think all eyes are on places like Texas. 
So uh, I do think you have some you know, great opportunities. Bill, I think um, there was a question. Oh, so, ahead, Bill, I do think that we need to recognize that there is four centuries of bigotry and racism against the African American community. And we as individuals need to not always be so focused about ourselves. Take the time to listen to your friends who are going through it. And rather than just lapping on saying, well, I had this happen. It's not about, it's, this is what is going on right now. It's targeted towards the African American community. It is not right now about the Asian American community. And we need not to be tone deaf. We need to really acknowledge that, you know, in terms of sheer numbers, that the disparity exists within the African American community, more so than any other segment of the population. I think that's critical. This is own that. Yeah, and I think you did that with, uh, you know, your African American sister. You had a conversation with her, and and it was a very eye opening uh, conversation. And I know, Telly, you you just got a little note here. Somebody was asking, uh, in light of what happened to uh, George Floyd and all the other people before, you know, Breonna Taylor, uh, Ahmaud Arbery, and many, many, many other African Americans before that. What can uh, the campaigns like Wash the Hate and Hate Is the Virus do? to align themselves to find solutions, not just for our community, but for other communities that suffer? Well, in addition to our campaign, other uh, anti-Asian uh, racism campaigns, uh, some of us have been uh, joining forces to engage uh, African-American organizations to have panels like these and dialogues, uh, inter-community conversations. Uh, so those, uh, some of those are happening right now. Uh, we're in the process of planning others. Uh, we've also been uh, reaching out to Black Lives Matter, uh, finding out how we could be a good ally um, and how to leverage our platform and, and the, the community that we've created. So we're exploring ways. And I, I think the challenge right now is we want to make sure that we're doing something purposeful that we can carry through. We don't want to just bandwagon and just put up a, a hashtag, but really want to take some action that uh, can make some impact. I think it's great. And Susan Phillips and I were having a conversation just the other day about how intentional we could be about reaching out to these communities. And one of my questions to Susan is, what are we doing with the Black Chamber? What are we doing with the Latin X Chamber? What are we doing with the Native American Chambers, with the Women's mm -hmm. Chambers, the LGBTQ Chambers? And, and she said she's making a concerted effort to do that. Because I will say one of the criticisms that the Black community said to me is, Bill, uh, name Asian Americans that serve on any African American or Latinx board. Um, I could only name one. And he said, name all the African Americans that are on Asian American boards. Uh, and it was well over 10, um, probably 20. Uh, and I said, and he said, why aren't you on our boards? Why aren't you helping us? Why aren't you at the grassroots with us? Uh, why are you fair weather friends? Uh, and so I thought that was a very important comment. So I think that all of us could be intentional about what we do uh, and not just wait for something like George Floyd to happen, but to reach out to the black community and say, we want to be part of what you're doing uh, and we're going to break these silos. So any thoughts on that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Okay, it wasn't sure. I know was. these are tough. These are tough conversations. This I'm is, trying to do yeah, as much as I can this, in an hour. So this is like 60 minutes with Bill Amato. <laughs> <So, laughs> uh, yeah, Heather, I'm getting really good questions. Yeah. I'm getting very good comments well, from the people in the audience, and I and I feel the same way. We no. should have these conversations. Yeah, and, so if we don't have them here, we got to have them sometime. Yeah, and I think there's definitely room for follow up on this because this cuts to the heart of, I think, what is the definition of racism? And I think there's actually a lot of confusion of that in this country because the history of racism in the United States and what is racism overall, it is about oppression. It is denial of access to equal opportunity economically, uh, health services, social services, voting, all those things that are barriers put in place by government policies. And I think once thinking back to when I served in the White House, uh, we were in the meeting and Senator Cory Booker said something very compelling. I think that cuts to the heart of everything we're talking to. He said, generational wealth in this country is created by biased government policies. So that is what has led to, I think, a lot of the racism, especially in the criminal justice system, the law enforcement, 
uh, in economic and voting systems that we are seeing. So we all have to collectively work together across all these broad, different diverse organizations if we're going to break down those barriers. And what that does mean, you know, being a former political guy is we need more people to run for office because it is at those key positions that dictate policy and dictate financial resources. The United States Congress right now is over one third people of color now. So that is huge representation. The United States Senate is not very few people of color on the US Senate. So, and we have some very compelling potential people, women of color could potentially be a vice presidential candidate. And we also had Andrew Yang who was running for president. So, so the elevation of visibility of Asian Americans alongside the Latino and African American communities are critical parts of our political and governmental system, which is what needs to solve these racist barriers amongst all of these different organizations. Um, I have to uh, pose a, a really important question that was asked to me about um, being engaged in the African American community. Um, uh, and, and so, and I think it's really perplexed. I think uh, our community and the maturity of our community as a Pan Asian consciousness of the Pan Asian community. But um, one of the things that African American leaders said to me is, um, where were the Asian American leaders? And not the folks like the Gen Z folks and the millennials and some of the Gen Xers that were protesting in the streets, but where were the Asian American leaders when Ahmad Arbery uh, was shot by two kind of citizen vigilantes? Uh, where was the Asian community when um, Breonna Taylor uh, was shot um, in Louisville? And, uh, and they said, you know, we can go back even further than that. So do we need to play a role in, in condemning that. And, and, and I bring this up only because one of the conversations that preceded this is uh, uh, we were asking the African-American community, the Latinx community, to support us on the fight against hatred and xenophobia. And one of the African-American leaders said, did you see what happened at McDonald's in China? Uh, and I said, yeah, I'm aware of that. And he goes, uh, why didn't you speak up about that, Bill? Uh, why didn't you say that that's wrong? Um, you work for McDonald's. Uh, and I thought that was a, a very important question. So do we need to be a little bit more intentional about that as well? I mean, uh, elections and getting people elected uh, is critically important, I get that. Uh, we need to be part of the de decision-making process. We need to be engaged, but do we need to be more intentional about uh, speaking up around injustice, around uh, social inequalities, around institutional racism and classism? Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think if we don't, then we are part of the problem. I've said that at the very beginning of the presentation. Um, what I've noticed, uh, I don't know where, when, kind of when we um, split the switch, but I certainly am seeing a lot more of the Asian bars, the different groups that services the, just the Asian community actually issuing out condemnations about what happened and the fact that they come they want they want to be part of the solution and they have offered help have we been perfect no but now that we're talking about it and having really frank conversations and unfortunately it took something so public and so brutal for it to happen but yes hopefully what this will do is to implore our community to really explore and to reach out further, um, because I think that's really the only way. It, it will happen again until we all stand up to it. Yeah, and I know that we have to wrap up and I have to turn the floor back to Susan, um, but I wanna make sure that I give all the panelists a chance to make some closing remarks. Uh, and of course, we kind of deviate a little bit after I said we probably shouldn't deviate, uh, but, but, I, but I think, uh, uh, a lot of the questions that were coming through the chat box kind of brought us back to uh, the realities of the situation today. Um, but I want to ask each of the panels, is there something that you'd like to say to everyone in the audience that wasn't discussed that you believe is very important to leave them with? Albert, Karen, Telly, who would like to start? Ladies first. Okay. Oh, Karen. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Albert, and thank you, Telly and Bill and all of um, the Asian Chamber for the opportunity to speak to you today. 
Um, the one piece of advice that I want everyone to think about is to be more introspective and to think more about your own personal biases. And certainly I was born in Hong Kong and then I came to the US. So I view things with a different lens. And, and if we start thinking about our own personal biases more and being self-aware, I think that will go a long way. And then once again, coming back to stepping outside your comfort zone, that's critically important. Um, and recognizing that, you know, I am not perfect, that I will, I will misstep, but I'm okay um, because I, I want to have my, my beliefs and my opinions challenged. But that's what I want everybody to walk away from is being more self-aware and being more intentional about your words um, and speak up more. Karen, yeah, you are very self-aware and she jumped in at the very last minute. So I just want to say thank you for that comment. So definitely we should be better about listening, being self-aware and, and speak up uh, yeah, and be best, better advocates for ourselves and our community. So uh, Albert, tell ta Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, you know, adding to Karen that we are faced the most difficult and challenging public health crisis that, you know, humanity has faced clearly. Uh, and what that means next, we don't know, given the economics as they turn back on and the frustration we are seeing, you know, unfold in real, real time uh, from the uh, disenfranchised communities, both from a, a law enforcement criminal justice perspective, but also from the economic recovery perspective. So I think it's upon us to, you know, work within those of us fortunate to still be working to leverage those relationships and those opportunities and turn this crisis into an opportunity for all of us to work together and no matter how small or big of a role you are in your corporation you know use your ergs you know be vocal about it and the corporate leaders are out there speaking literally setting the table for us to be more involved and be more bold so i think this is time for boldness uh, in terms of working with the african-american latinx the tribal nations and any other disenfranchised community in the country uh, for, us, uh, for those of us in the private sector to do as much as we can to help them out. And we're going to need people internally. We need Karen yeah. and we need Albert to be pushing internally in these corporations to help us get them to do the right thing. But we also need people on the outside, including all the people that are listening in. They also have to push corporations and governmental agencies to do the right thing. So thank you, uh, Albert, for saying that we need to be Old. Uh, Telly, you get to close it out. Yeah, no, I echo everything that uh, Karen and Albert said. And I think what uh, this recent incident has taught us is that silence and inaction is complicity. Um, and we really, and that's something that we haven't addressed here, but that's obviously there's an Asian American police officer involved with um, the murder of George Floyd. And he stood by while it happened. And I think that's uh, unacceptable. And we need to raise our voices and really stand up. And, and face the evil that's around us um, and really begin first with ourselves and our communities. Yeah, so I, I agree. We have to hold, hold not only ourselves accountable, but even people that are from our community accountable uh, to mm -hmm. do the right thing and to, you know, to advance our communities, all communities. So really good message points, all of you. So thank you. And I want to thank Telly, Karen, and Albert for their time. And I want to thank all of you for being on this uh, video conference. I know everybody's kind of zoomed out, uh, but thank you so much for participating in this. And I need to turn this over to Susan, who wants to provide some closing remarks. So Susan, it's back to you. And thank you to the Asian Chamber of Texas uh, for putting this on. Oh, well, goodness, uh, Bill, thank you for moderating the panel. I mean, you're fantastic. You're you're a legend in, your, in, in, in my mind anyway. Um, Telly, Albert, and Karen, I can't thank you all enough for being a part of this very important conversation. And as I close today, I just want to just touch on everything that's happened. And I, I sent out a statement yesterday and through our uh, email uh, blast uh, just to recognize what the current situation we're in and how sensitive this, this topic is. I mean, I, I was very emotionally moved by all everything that's happening um you know of course the situation with our you know the asian uh, population and how we've been affected by um the 
the the impact of COVID and and the and all the negative things that are happening, but this is this is of utmost importance as well. And um, you know, we we definitely don't want to ignore the fact that we have a responsibility here. And as global citizens, you know, it is our responsibility to recognize everybody and not ignore the fact that they are our brothers and sisters and they're going through the same thing we're going through in in many ways worse than we are so on that i'm going to leave you um but thank you all for attending and i hope that you will tune in next time we will continue the conversation this is not over this is an important continuation of a conversation um because it's not going away uh part of the statement that i had put out yesterday i quoted um mb former nba player Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in his op-ed for the LA Times, and he stated, he made an analogy of racism as being like dust. When you're in the dark, you don't really see the dust, basically, I'm paraphrasing here. But as soon as the light, or you take a light, flashlight and you shine it in the, in the air, you see where the dust has actually settled. And what I took from that and, and what he's trying to impart is the message that, you know, we need to be the flashlight. And conversations like these are are the way that we actually bring to surface. It's no longer a topical issue. We have to dig deep. So, you know, shining a light on these subject matter, even if it is a little bit tough to talk about, I know we have our differences. We all do, but we have more in common than we have differences. And so as long as we lead with that thought, we will always find some way to come together and support one another. We have to show up as a community as a community of, of Asians, Blacks, Latin, you name it, we need to be there for each other. Thank you all for joining us. I look forward to our next time. Take care. Bye-bye.